Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys and assembled company, welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. And tonight we are in for a treat. We have storytelling teachers from around the world, followed by, from Cork in Ireland, Maria Gillen. But... I am not going to introduce people because I haven't the faintest idea of who they are. It's all going to be a big surprise to me as it is to you. So I'm going to let David Heesfield, uh, who, who, who goes by Zoom around this world, from teacher to teacher and school to school, introduce his people. David, it's over to you. Thank you, John. Wonderful to be here. Really excited to be here and really excited to be kind of guest uh, host with you at this event. I've been running courses for teachers and I'll say a bit about those courses, but really, I really want to focus on the stories. And I think rather than spend time introducing everybody, I'm gonna go, we'll go straight into the first story and I'll say something after that. And present in the room with us is uh, Heba Ham Hamuda. Hi, Heba. And Heba, all the stories that I'm going to introduce are actually recordings because sometimes there are issues with um, technology, with connections. Um, Heber's in Gaza and sometimes the internet is unreliable there, for example. Some of the stories coming later are from um, India where it's the middle of the night. So we're having recordings, but they'll, they'll be present with us and um, certainly with the, with the recordings. So straight into Heber Hamuda telling a, a wonderful story, one of my very favorites. Once upon a time, Joha went to the market to buy a donkey. And when he arrived at the market, he saw a special donkey that he liked a lot. So he decided to buy this donkey. While he was at the market, two thieves saw him and planned to deceive him. So he bought the donkey and he went home. While he was in his way home, one of the thieves came and moved the halter from around the necks, the, the donkey's necks into his own necks. But Johan didn't notice that. He kept walking without noticing him. Only when he arrived home, he looked behind to see a man behind him, not the donkey. So he was surprised and he asked, who are you? I'm a bad man, sir, responds the thief weeping. Why? I disobeyed my mother and I was cursed and turned into a donkey. Only when I met you, sir, I was able to turn back to my human nature. I don't know how to thank you, sir. May God bless you, sir, said the thief. So Joha was touched by the thief's words and he decided to free him. He approached the donkey and whispered to him to, to obey his mother always. The next day, Joha went to the market again in order to buy another donkey. And to his surprise, he saw the same donkey he bought yesterday at the market. So he was surprised. And he approached the donkey and whispered to him, you disobeyed your mother again? I won't buy you this time. I swear, you deserve what happened to you. And that was the end of uh, Johan and the Disobedient Donkey story. It's one of the uh, Arab folk tales uh, in which Johan character is represented as a silly person.
In some other versions of, of Joha's stories, Joha can be uh, introduced as a clever or tricky man and so on. Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. And Joha, of course, is the Arabic name. Many of us know the same character as Nasruddin or Hodja or Mullah Nasruddin. Stories are told about him throughout, well, the Islamic world, but now all around the world. These wonderful tales. That's Thank one of my you. favorites. It really is. Never disobey your mother. <laughs> Important you. lesson. Heather, you're, I met you through the Hands Up project. Um, you're one of the volunteers, volunteer teachers in Gaza, in Palestine, with the Hands Up Project, which is all about reaching um, teachers and particularly children and teenagers living in Gaza and other areas of Palestine where there's crisis and giving them a chance to communicate with other children and teachers all around the world. And then I was very glad to be able to invite you and other teachers from Palestine on courses that I've been running. Um, so it's it, it, just great to hear you telling that story. The pleasure is mine, David. I, I'm really honored to have you as my trainer in that course and to join you in this uh, uh, meeting. And I hope we can work uh, with together in, in the future. Of course we will. Of course we will. Thank you very much, Heather. Is any, does anyone have a quick question from, for Heather before we move on? Except to say it was magnificent. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank I you, think Heather. we better move on because... Better move on. Better move on. Okay, <laughs> great. So I, I, I just want to ask you, Liu, do you, is, is, do you think the other videos are going to work okay? Well, should we try? Let's see what happens. Okay. So the next storyteller, storytelling teacher that I want to introduce is Mindy Neo. And I know that Mindy's going to be watching this with her students in the morning, because right now it's about well, two o'clock in the morning, I think, in Singapore. And Mindy's right now, she's a primary school teacher. She joined the course as well. The course I, I run is called Creative and Engaging Storytelling for Teachers. And I met Mindy with the Storytelling Association in Singapore. And yeah, she's just a wonderful, she tells stories every day with her students. Anyway, over to you, Mindy. Hello, David, and all who are watching on World Storytelling Cafe. My name is Mindy and I'm from Singapore. I'm a primary school teacher here, and I believe in sharing a story of my students every day. I was also a student of David's on his Crest course, and through his course, I had learned how to craft creative responses for my stories uh, so that the students would have a deeper connection to the story, they're part of the story, and they think deeper about the story. Uh, he's a marvelous teacher, and I strongly recommend that you be part of his course, okay? Well, the story I'm going to tell you today is called The Ship Full of Needles. And it comes from a very ancient text called the Malay Annals of Sajarat Melayu. I hope you like the story. A very long time ago, there was a king by the name of Raja Suran. Now, Raja Suran ruled over India. Raja Suran wanted to be the most powerful king in the world. And he got princes from neighboring countries to pay tributes to him in rice and gold and call him the most powerful king. But Raja Suran was not happy. You see, the emperor of China refused to call him the most powerful king in the world. And that made Raja Suran angry, so angry that he wanted to invade China. But, but, the problem was Raja Suran had no clue where China was. He thought that China was in the south. So he gathered soldiers from all over the empire 
there were so many weapons it was impossible to count there were so many horses and elephants that they were impossible to count and he managed to garner a huge and powerful army he led his army southwards past Myanmar into Thailand and they traveled along the coast down to Malaya or Malaysia as we know now. Everywhere they went, the trees were flattened, the rivers dried up and mountains trembled. This noise was terrifying, was frightening. Now, when they got to the south of Malaya, they found themselves at the coast, at the sea, and across them was Singapore. But at that time, it was not called Singapore. Singapore was not called Singapore, it was called Tamasic. So Rajasuran ordered his men to build rafts and they all continued their journey southwards in the hope of finding China. Now, because Rajasuran had such a huge army and there was so much destruction wherever they went, the traders who were sailing along the coast, trading spices, aromatic wood, gold, they heard about Rajasuran's plans and they knew that he was trying to find China. So they told their friends and their friends told their friends and their friends told their friends. And finally, it reached the ears of the Emperor of China. Now, the Emperor of China was so worried that he called all his ministers and told them, Raja Suran's army is so powerful. If they come to China, we will be doomed. Now, the ministers thought about a plan. And the his chief minister had whispered into the ears of the emperor. And the emperor was pleased with the plan. So the next day, the chief minister went to the harbour to look for a ship. Oh, but not just any ship. Not a new ship. Not a big ship. He got himself a very old ship. The ship was so old that its sail was yellow and the wooden boards on the ship were creaking and they were, some of them were broken. And the people just couldn't believe it. How was, how was this ship going to go against the army of Rajasuran? The next thing the chief minister did was to find the sailors. Well, but the, the sailors that he found were not young, strong men. They were very, very old men. These men were so old, they, they had trouble walking up to the ship. They were so old that some of them had to be carried onto the ship. <sighs> the people were really puzzled. Crazy, they said. He's crazy. And then the chief minister got his men to dig up some fruit trees and plant them in pots. And then these pots were then transferred to the ship. Hmm. And finally, he told his men to get as many rusty needles as they could from all over China. And they did. And one of his men came up to him and said, Sir, uh, we've got so many rusty needles. In fact, we have 50 bags of rusty needles. Shall we throw them away? Oh, no, 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 no. You do not throw those rusty needles away. You will bring them up to the ship. Well, people couldn't understand what was happening. An old ship with old sailors, with fruit trees and rusty needles, huh? But the emperor and the chief minister looked at all the arrangements done and they were pleased. 
And so the ship set sail for Tamasic, or Singapore. Now, soon the ship reached Tamasic and Rajasuran, his men who were at the harbour watched this ship slowly moving towards them. And from what they could see was a very old ship that had all men sailing it and fruit trees. And they thought to themselves, ah, what is this? What is this? And one of them quickly went to tell Raja Suran, who came to the shore. And so when the ship came to the, came to the harbour, Raja Suran went up to them and asked one of the old men, where are you from? And an old man bowed, slight bow, and said, so we are from China. You, you are from China? Yes, sir. When we first set out from China, we were young, strong men. And we came with bags of seeds and we came with iron bars. But because of the long journey from China to Tamasic, we have become so old. The seeds that we brought have become fruit trees and the iron bars, sir, they rusted so much until they become needles, rusty needles. And the old man slowly opened that bag of needles and showed it to Raja Suran. And Raja Suran was shocked. He thought to himself, if I invade China, I'm, I'm going to be old by the time I reach there. My soldiers are going to be very old. Oh, he couldn't believe it. And he decided that day not to invade China. And Raja Suran and his men returned to India and thought about another country that they could conquer. That was how China was saved from the army of Rajasuran. Thank you. Wow, a story from the Malay annals about Rajasuran. And Mindy, I know you're watching this with your students in the morning. So yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Brilliant. Okay. Well, um, Jackie Ross is with us in the room. Jackie sent a wonderful video. Um, Jackie's a, a storyteller, a very established storyteller in the northeast of Scotland and often tells stories in Doric, in the, in the dialect. And today she's telling us a story in English. Um, but a story that comes from Scotland and a story that's just so beautiful. And look at the setting of this story. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Jackie after the recording, but let's go straight into this beautiful story Jackie shares from her own family farm right up in the northeast of Scotland. Hello, David, and hello to everybody across the globe who's joining us today on the World Storytelling Cafe. I'm delighted to be with you and to share with you a story from my home country of Scotland. As you can see, I'm at home, well, I'm in the byre actually, the cow shed. And the reason for that is because the story I'm going to tell you today is about a coo, a cow. And it comes from this wonderful book of Scottish folk tales. I love this story because it includes a cow. And being a farmer's daughter, I have a real passion for cows. I'm going to tell it in my mother tongue, which is Doric, but I'll intersperse some simultaneous English translation 
just to make sure that you can follow the story. I hope you enjoy. Awa hiney back. There was a man fa bidwee's wife and his loon and a wee hoosie doon by the black water. The couple and their son enjoyed living in this small cotter house and they had a good life. They also had a cow. In the coo was cried Bruni. Well, a day, the wife got out to the buyer to milk the coo. But when she opened the buyer door, the coo was gone. Nay, why to be seen? Hey, John, did you shift the coo? She asked her husband if he had moved the cow. He said, na, na, henna. She asked her son, hey, Tom, if you moved the coo? Na, na, he says, a henna, mother. And so the hell family went hunting for the coo. They went up a hell and doon a how. They went through the woods and along the burren. But they couldn't find the coo anyway. Well, that night, the mother was in a terrible state. She says, oh me, fit are we gone to dee? What will we do? We want to have any milk or butter or cheese for the hell winter. We'll be starving. So Tom, the young loon, he said he would ging and hunt for the coo the morn's morn. So the next day he got up and he teen a stout stick and he was ready to march awa and his mother cried, hang on a minty Tom. I'll gie ye a big bannock to tuck wee ye, because if the giants have teen a coo, ye might hae far enough to gang afore ye find her. So Tom took the food from his mother and he put it into his pocket and he set off to hunt for the cow. Well, he walk it and he walk it and he walk it until he was fair exhausted, funert he was in real hunger and awe. So he sat doon to eat. He teen a bannock out his pooch and he was munching a wa for an idea come to him. So he cries out, he says, Bruni, Bruni, give me a moo if you, so I can hear for you are. And he listened and he heard moo. A wa in the distance. Well, Tom got up and he gid towards that soon. He followed it. Aye. And afore long he shouts out again, he says, Bruni, Bruni, give me a moo so I can for you are. Moo came back the soon. And Tom followed it. Well, he get on and on and on and oh me, he was fair funert and fair exhausted. So he sat down to rest. But he cried out, he says, Bruni, Bruni. Give me a moo so I can for yar. Moo came back the soon. <gasps> and it was as though Bruni was wrecked aneath his feet. So Tom got up and he got down a hell. And when he got to the bottom of the hell, he seen a cave. So he got into the cave and there was Bruni tied up with a muckle tow roon its neck. Tom out his knife to try and cut a rope, but it was worth thick. So he'd nothing else to do but try and undo all the knots. Well, his fingers and his thumbs were fair sair by the time he'd untied all the knots. But eventually, Bruni was free, and they started out of the cave and a wa down the road to ging him. Well, they hadn't got very far. Then twa muckle giants come striding o'er the hell towards them. And when Tom seen these muckle brutes, he says, Oh, Bruni, Bruni, what are we going to do? The lake caught us in a nay time at all. In a shock of a lamy's tail, they'll be here. And Bruni, the coo, said, Duck a hairy out of my tail and lay it on the ground. So that's what Tom did. He pulled a hair out of Bruni's tail and laid it down on the ground. And a coo said, Hair of my tail, hair of my tail, 
turn into a muckle burren. The biggest river you ever seen. Ian, that's as big that only a birdie could flee across it. In a blink of an e, there was a muckle burren there in front of them. But Finn the Twa Giants reached the other side. The big muckle giant says, Ha! That one a henner is long. We'll see and catch you. That will never stop us. And he cried to the littler giant to ging and get their muckle bull. So the little giant went and got their great big bull and he came to the water side and he went <laughs> and he sucked up all the water in a big gulp. And the giant strode on. Well, Tom turned to Bruni and said, Oh, Bruni, Bruni, fit what would do? The giants will be on us afore you can say boo. Well, Bruni said, Pluck a hair from a lug and put it on the ground. So Tom pulled a hair from Bruni's ear and put it on the ground. And Bruni said, Hair him a lug, hair him a lug. Turn into a blazing fire, as big as you could only put it out, we a burren that's bigger than anybody can cross, a pert fair birdie. <coughs> well, before long, the giants had come to the other side of this blazing fire, and the big muckle giant cried out, he says, This one a hinner is long. Na, nah, na, nah, we're going to catch you. This fire wanna stop us. Well, he brought up his big muckle ball, and the ball opened his moo and out poured all the water and put a fiery out, and the giants marched on. Oh, me, says Tom, fit we going to dee, Bruni, they'll be weas afore you can say Jack Robinson. Well, says Bruni, pluck a hair off my back and lay it on the ground. So that's what Tom did. He pulled a hair out of Bruni's back and laid it on the ground. And the coo said, hair on my back, hair on my back, turn into a muckle mountain, as big as reach of clouds, wah, up in the sky. And in a blink of an eye, there was a muckle mountain between them and the twa giants. But the great muckle giant says, as when a hinner is long, we're gone to catch you. You want to stop us? And he sent the littler giant to ging and get a big drill. And he started to drill a hole through the mountain. And afore long, he could keek right through to the other side and see Tom and Bruni disappearing into the distance. Well, that giant didn't want to waste any time so he loped it into the hole and he squeezed and tried to get right through to the other side but he was fair stuck he couldn't get for it he couldn't get back and Finn the other giant tried to haul him out with the legs he wouldn't budge of all he was fair stuck and he stuck there until he turned to steam but Tom and Bruni, they won him, all the white he's mither and feather. And as far as I can, they lived happily ever after. And that's my tale of Bruni the Coo. I hope you enjoyed it as much as the scenes did. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jackie. That was absolutely wonderful. And I, I, I want to apologise to everyone for my terrible error at the beginning. I said that Jackie was going to tell the story in English and there was some English there, but we really got a wonderful taste of your home culture and your home language dialect of Doric. So, Jackie, thank you so much indeed. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Yes, I mean, the, the, the people who are coming on my course are some are teachers who are learning about storytelling, some are storytellers like Jackie, who's also a teacher, but working in educational settings, like most of us storytellers. So the last recording to share with you as part of this session is from 
Uh, oh, Jackie, could you just tell us a little a little bit more about the the, the, the provenance of that story? You told us it came from that this this wonderful co book collection. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, I think there are versions from other countries too, and I know you tell one from Iceland, don't you? I do. You know, um, and that doesn't surprise me that that we've got that in common because yeah. you know there, there's lots of trade between Scandinavian countries and Scotland. So um, the, I, the the book says it's a, an Aberdeenshire story, um, so that's why I chose it. But well, I chose that because I like cows as well. Where exactly are you, Jackie? Uh, I'm on Royal D side, um, not far from Balmoral Castle. So Fantastic. halfway between Aberdeen and Balmoral. Okay, so the last story of this session, thank you so much, Jackie, is from Kahani Wachak Swati. And Kahani Wachak means storyteller. And uh, Swati is in Delhi. And this is a story that she uh, tells from her home culture, the area of India where she was born in Chota Nagpur. So yeah, over to the last story of this sharing and yeah, Swati, enjoy listening to yourself tell the story. Hi everybody, my name is Swati Sinha. Hi David, let me introduce myself to all of you. I am a storyteller and I narrate stories by the name of Kahani Vajak Swati. Today, I have got for you a very beautiful folk tale which belongs to the land of Chotanagpur. Chotanagpur is a, one of the parts of India as I belong to India, New Delhi, and I was born in Chotanagpur, so I thought it to be right to narrate a story of my birthplace. So, here goes the story. This story is about four friends who have grown up together. When they grow up, they choose four different professions. The first one becomes a weaver. The second one is a vermilion trader. The third one is a goldsmith. And the fourth one is a wood carver. The four friends decide one day to go to town to look for jobs for themselves. And so they start their journey. On their way, uh, when it's close to night and it's evening time, they decide to halt in a forest. While they are lying down, they decide that one of the friends will sit as a guard while the others will take rest and this will happen turn wise. So the first one who sat on guard to guard themselves from the wild animals of the forest, the other three slept. The first one was the wood cover. So he looks around because he's sitting idle and he's getting bored. He finds a piece of log near him. So he just picks up that piece of log and starts carving. And gradually he starts carving the figure of a woman. When his carving is finished, he looks at the log and he has admires the beautiful woman that he has carved. He's very satisfied with his work. And at the same time, he is tired now. So he wakes up his goldsmith friend and goes off to sleep. When the goldsmith friend is sitting idle, he looks around and he chances to see that wooden log which is now turned into a beautiful woman. He says something is missing in this figure and then he decides to adorn that log with jewelry, ornaments. So he gives some bangles to the woman, a neck piece, and beautiful anklets and then he goes off to sleep. The third friend who is on guard now is a weaver. When he sees this woman adorned with beautiful ornaments, he loves her and he says there's something missing which will make her look more beautiful and then he decides to weave a sari for the woman. So he picks up his threads and weaves a beautiful sari for the woman and adorns her with the sari. Now the woman looked really pretty, almost real. And then the friend goes off to sleep and wakes up the vermilion trader. When the vermilion trader looks at this beautiful wooden log, uh, the woman, he falls in love with her instantly. And so he picks up a pinch of the vermilion 
and puts it on her forehead. Anne goes off to sleep. By the time he goes off to sleep, it's almost daybreak. Some magic happens right then. While he was going off to sleep, this log, wood, wooden log, who's now turned into a beautiful woman figure, comes to life. And all the friends, when they get up, they're surprised to see this beautiful woman adorned with beautiful sari and ornaments and vermilion on her forehead, sitting alive in front of them. And she's so pretty that all of them fall in love with her instantly. But then a fight begins. They start fighting amongst themselves as to who would get married to this beautiful woman. Right at that time, a passerby who happens to be a saint, a priest, was crossing from there. All the four friends make him stop and asks the priest that this is a confusion that has come up. If you could please resolve our confusion, our problem. The priest listens to the whole story and then passes his judgment. He says, the person who carved the woman, who gave birth to this woman, is the father of that woman. The person who gave her sari is the uncle of the woman. The person who gave her ornaments is the brother of the woman. And the person who put vermilion on her forehead is the right person to be her husband. So all the four friends agree to the priest's judgment and that's how the vermilion merchant becomes the husband of the woman. This is a tradition which is still followed in Chotanagpur and when a girl and a boy are wed together, the boy puts vermilion on the forehead of the girl and that's how the wedding is supposed to be complete. I hope you like the story and I have to tell you that I got wed in the same way and I still put vermilion on my forehead as a mark of being a married woman. I hope you've enjoyed the story. So, this is Swati Sinha, Kahani Vajik Swati, saying goodbye to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Swati Sinha, Kahani Vajik Kahani Swati. Wonderful, wonderful storytelling and why the women in Totanagpur put vermilion on their forehead when they're married. Fantastic. Whoa. Well, we've had these four wonderful stories from around the world, from storytellers that I'm so lucky to meet. And uh, yeah, I want to say thank you to all of them. I want to remind you that Jackie Ross and Kahani Wachakswati both have uh, lots of stories on YouTube. So if you want to check out their YouTube channels, have a look at the stories on YouTube. And uh, you, there'll be Jay. more stories coming soon from more storytelling teachers. And, Over uh, to you, John. Thanks for having us. Well, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, we, we just, we'll just, uh, we'll just, it's just all one, it's all one night. Uh, uh, and we're, we're, we're still carrying on around the world. We're still going down to one of my, one of my favorite areas. I've got lovely memories of, uh, of Cork and, and, and from Cork, we've got, uh, we, we, I, I, I've, I've put her on the magic carpet and I'm flying her across to the cafe. And uh, as far I can see, she's landed. She's landed, and yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, and uh, so, please, can we welcome Maria Gillen? And thank you, everyone. Uh, please don't go away. Um, we'll 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 all have a big. Na we'll all retire to uh, either the bar or the tea house or the coffee house, where whatever we virtually want to be in, and have a natter afterwards. All right. But for right now, could you please put your hands together and welcome Maria Gillen? Hello, everybody. How lovely it is to be here. And I have my cup of tea. It's very badly needed when you're having a story session to have your cup of tea right there ready because if you run out of stories you turn the cup upside down and when you look inside at the tea leaves it tells you stories of their own <laughs> so um tonight i thought i'd introduce some of the stories from my storytelling style i'm a drama therapist so i make medicinal stories in co-creation with a number of uh, different groups from very young all the way, you know, from the cradle to the grave. And that's what I love about stories. So this story 
came in the middle of a beautiful session run by Maria Watton every Wednesday. So as I was listening to the other stories, this story was building for me. And it's called The Baby in the Butter Box. Michal was working in the modern world. He was all about spreadsheets and deadlines and smart goals and all of these things. And you know, he considered all of the old traditions to be pishogs, things that you could leave in the corner of the room for a different time and a different people. But his mam, his mam was worried about him because the mists of Samhain were rising from the River Lee. They were curling through the city and they were looking for the non-believers. The veil was thinning and you could feel in the air that the magic was permeating. Michal left the house to go on a night out and his mother said, oh Michal, Michal don't go. Sure the veil is thinning and I'm worried about you. And she threw the holy water after him as he walked past her and said, ma'am, that's for the old days. But the mists were thickening and they were climbing up the hills of Cork. And he came from one of the highest hills in Cork, up from Mayfield, where I grew up myself. He started to make his way down towards the Victoria Barracks, Collins Barracks it's called these days. And if those limestone walls could talk, oh, the stories that they would tell you. And the mist kept creeping, kept thickening. And Michal noticed that, that things began to become solid there and then to fade away again. And he began to believe the stories of old and then brushed it off. He was walking down the hill now with his bicycle and the moisture was beginning to gather on it and drip from the handlebars. Drip, drip on his hand it went. And then in the mists, he saw a face coalesce. It became as solid as you or I. The cheeks were hollow, the eyes so sad. Why was this being so sad, he wondered. And as if by invitation, the man stepped out of the mist. The first thing that Michal noticed were that the clothes he wore were from a gone by era. His hands were all gnarled as if he worked hard all his life and the nails black with dirt. He looked down then. And when he looked down, he saw it, the box. Without being asked, he knew that he was meant to look in that box. So he stepped forward and he lifted a little bit of the cloth. And when he looked in, he saw the reason for the sorrow in the man's eyes. For there was a baby, a little baby, who never had a chance at life, inside in this little wooden butter box. Michal looked at the man and without words invited him to put the burden down on the back of his bicycle. And this the man did, gratefully, and as if it was a great weight but Michal knew that there couldn't be much weight in this box at all. The man began to descend the fever hospital steps of Cork, the mist curling up to meet him so that Michal could not see his feet strike the ground. Michal fell into step behind him, following him at a funeral pace, respectfully silent. When they got to the end of the steps, they turned right then left behind Murphy's Brewery and up the narrow little alleyways of Cork until they came to another set of steps, an ancient set of steps. They walked up the steps and came to the top of Shandon Street and looking down, Michal began to feel a creeping fear. There was no electric lights here, not one car and the buildings they looked newer somehow. Fear began to, fear began to clutch at Michal's heart, but he followed the man down the hill, down towards the River Lee. And just before the end, the man turned left into a graveyard. 
But surely, surely this graveyard had been tarred over and was now a car park. Mihal started to look around and then he noticed that the man and was doing grave to go until he found a new one and then gratefully he knelt at the end of it and began to dig out a little hole with his own hands then he put his hands up for the precious cargo and Michal gave it to him and he put it into the ground the man began to say the old prayers in the old language he intoned. And Michal answered, surprising himself that he still knew these old, sacred words. Then the man looked at him with such gratitude, with such thanks, that Michal began to feel ashamed and couldn't hold his gaze. And at that moment, the mist got thicker still and swallowed the man. Michal felt the fear then. It spread from his heart up through his throat into his legs and he took off running, leaving his bicycle there. He ran to the River Lee and then went left. And then he saw it, the lights of a bus. Thank God, he said. And then he heard the sounds of the bustle of a city. Now Michal will never again mock Samhain Eve and on Shan Nos, the old ways. He'll stay indoors when the Samhain mists thin and the veil opens. And that's my first story. <laughs> So that comes from the old traditions of the babies in the butter box when during famine times people didn't have enough money to bury babies in sanctified ground and a lot of time babies were not um, who hadn't been baptized weren't welcome in sanctified ground. So during the dark of the night, it was the father's job to find a, an open grave and to bury the little baby there. And the two souls would keep one another company into eternity. So I love that story. Or I love that tradition. And now it's in a story to live on. So that's my first story. Um, my second story came from a storytelling circle. So I love the storytelling circles. I love the co-creation of stories. And this story um, came from my sisters. I was sent a mantra, my story sisters, not my blood sisters. I was sent a mantra. And then I went uh, to Cape Clare and Orla, who is visiting tonight, she was in my storytelling house and was there at the birth of this story. So I'll just tell you the story. Deedle deedle deedle, deedle deedle dum. Deedle 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 dum deedle 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 dee deedle deedle dum deedle 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 dum. All the children in the whole village had the same dream, and they'd come down from their little bedrooms early in the morning, and they'd sit there eating their cornflakes and their little heads nodding, and them singing to themselves. <laughs> and the great grandmothers and the grandmothers and the mothers, they'd look at one another with knowing looks and they would know that it was time. Shh. In the middle of the night, they'd open the door and they'd say to the children, come on, come on, come with us. We have something to show you. Shh. And the children would hold their hands and they'd open the doors of the houses of the village, letting them open, letting the light pour out. And they'd walk down the street towards the old and ancient forest. And the night would lit be lit only 
by the big fat moon and the stars twinkling through the branches and the children would feel under their feet Deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum into the forest they'd go being pulled further in by the rhythm the heartbeat of mother and they'd get to the center of the forest and they would see the big hill there and the children would put their hot little faces on mother's breast and deep in the earth, they would hear her heartbeat. Deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum, deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum. So it was, so it is, so it always should be. But first the grandmothers, and then the mothers forgot. And the children would hear the tune and feel the call, but not know what it was or that they were being called. And mother got sad. Do you remember when mother got sad? When she cried big fat tears into the rivers of the world and into my own river Lee. When those rivers swole up and Whoosh, flooded the cities. Deedle diddle deedle, dee deedle diddle dum, deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum. She cried her sad song, but nobody listened. Everybody was too busy blaming other people. It was him. No, it was him. No, it was that fellow over in America. I'm sure it was. It was him. Mother got angry. Do you remember when mother got angry? When she put a big fire through her belly, up through that mountain in Iceland, a big white cloud came and stopped all the planes from flying. Do you remember when gra when mother got angry? Deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum. Deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum. Deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum. Deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum. People listened then. And they tweeted and they twittered and they got on television and they got on telephones, but nobody listened. Poor mother. So she gathered all her strength. Do you remember when mother gathered all her strength? When she made a big tsunami and whoosh, drowned that village in Japan. Oh, the people were afraid then. And all mother wanted them to do was to listen. But they had forgotten how. Until one child in the middle of the night heard. Deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum. Deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum. What's that? She said curiously. She got out of her bed, went out the front door, found the old path to the forest, saw how the moon shone down on this path and how the starlight twinkled through the branches. She followed the sound right into the centre of the forest and there was the hill, mother's breast. And the child put her hot little face to mother's breast. Deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum and in her child's voice she sang back deedle diddle deedle dee deedle diddle dum deedle diddle deedle diddle deedle diddle dum and everything stopped And everything was silent. For that is what mother wanted. And this story was born 
from a very old mantra from the Native American Indians. And it goes like this. Hey, ya, hey, ya, hey, ya, ya, hey, ya, hey, ya, ho. Hey, ya, hey, ya, hey, ya, hey, ya, hey, ya, ho. Mother, I feel you under my feet. Mother, I hear your heart beat. And so we can learn from other cultures and we can learn from the children and we can learn when we stop. So that is my second story. Oh, it's so lovely to see all the faces. Okay, so I'm going to tell one more story because John Rowe tells me I can tell three and then I'm going to stop. So um, my third story, what would I tell you from my third story? I'm going to tell you about a monument in Cork. It's a monument that marks a time when Ireland was going through famine and we needed help and we got it. So this story is to remember that and to mark that. It was the 1800s in Ireland and famine was biting at the shoulder and the spirit of era herself. The people were thin and ragged and losing hope. These people who had come from the high kings of Ireland, who had one time been holders of the Brehan law, they now found themselves hungry in every way possible. The O'Brien clan in County Kerry were absolutely no exception. And they made the hard decision that the healthy branch of the family must leave this place must leave Ireland in order to live. They packed up their meagre possessions and they left Kerry, traveling along the butter roads on thin bones and empty bellies until they came to the city of Cork. There they slept under hedges and under trees until they could walk further on to Cove. Every single penny they had went to buying passage for those that were healthy in the branch to leave these shores. Mr. O'Brien couldn't watch it. He couldn't watch the little wake where the family was throwing their arms around one another, whispering little endearments. Never forget from where you come, they said. Remember our songs and our stories, they said. Remember us. Write us letters if you can. And they kissed one another and took their leave. Mr. O'Brien climbed to the top of the headland in Cove and watched the scene play out. And anger and anguish and rage and sorrow began to roll in his belly and it rolled northwards through his throat and out through his mouth. And as it did, like in the old days, the Druid days, the wind rose over the Atlantic Ocean. To receive his words, you understand, not to drown them out. And Mr. O'Brien said, Ta ochris arum, ochris andawan, ochris erma corp, ochris erma cree, maroig sheath me, maroig sheath me. Cowrigling, cowrigling. And on his last words, he fell forward into the warm, wet earth of Era. But the wind had taken his words and was following the ship across the Atlantic Ocean, where his children, the beating hearts, were traveling to a better place. When the wind got to America, she climbed the aspen trees and played there for a while. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yo, ho. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yo, ho. La, 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 la,
Sandawin Ocris Kaurikling Kaurikling Heya, 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 ya, heya, heya, ho. Heya, 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 ho. Grandfather Choctaw looked into the fire, listening to the foreign words as the wind danced in the aspen tree. What did they mean, these beautiful words with that other world rhythm? And he took them to bed so that he might bring them to the land of dreams to discuss them with the ancestors. He didn't dream long before the face of Mr. O'Brien came before him with the hollowed out cheeks and the eyes fallen back in his head. And he could hear in the language of spirit what Mr. O'Brien was saying to him. I am starving, he said. My people are starving. We are starving in our bellies. We are starving in our hearts. But most of all, we are starved of hope in our spirits. Help us. Help us. <sighs> Grandfather Choctaw took that dream to his people. He gathered them around as they struck their camp because they themselves were on the trail of tears, being moved from their ancestral lands thousands of miles into an unhospitable place. And his people were weary. Are you serious? They said to him when he told him of the dream. Do you see that man up there on the horse? That man that pushed grandmother into the dirt? He's from Ireland from a place called Cork. And you see that man down there, that man with the big stick that have scared our children into silence. He is also from Ireland and you want us to help them. Grandfather Choctaw went to each individual and looked deep into their eyes. If you do not do anything differently, from these people, are you then different? We come from a people who have elegance of spirit. If we do not help these people, can we expect any better from them? I will let that with you. As they marched, the Choctaw clan thought on grandfather's words. They gathered together one hundred and seventy six dollars, a princely sum. They hired a great ship and filled it with corn and sent it across the Atlantic Ocean to Ireland into the deepest harbour, Cove, from where Mr. O'Brien had cried out to the wind. That corn was distributed through the island of Ireland. It saved many lives, lives of my relatives. That corn still plays and dances in the fields of era today. In the year 2020, the Hopi and Navajo nations found that it was difficult for their elders to stay apart under COVID restrictions. They had to leave their place to go and draw water from a well. There was one shop to serve a territory the size of Ireland and they called for help. First, one little email came in. You are on Clan Cana, the same tribe. You are our kindred spirits. We have never forgotten. Here's my offering, $10. Then another little note came. Why are we getting these little love notes from Era, from Ireland, they said. And the trickle became a river, became a great sea of love and the message always the same. We have never forgotten. You are on Clan Cana, the same tribe. You are our kindred 
spirits. And that's my third story. <laughs> well, that was wonderful. And and I mean, Colin Owen's got the beautiful song about that. Yeah. Tim Tingle, the Choctaw storyteller, tells it. And uh, um, it's just, and that, that, that just added just a whole bit to the story. So thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. um, before we before we chat, I better say what's coming up. You're all invited to every second week. We have an open storytelling, which will be start would be next week, next Sunday. Um, every other Sunday, I program it like this, and then fifteenth and every other from then on. Just feel free. Just come in. If I if I see people from, but it's. Uh, uh, other parts of the world with, the, with weird times or problems like they've got in Gaza, we'll put the Gaza people on early. But please come. And then in two weeks' time, if you've been joined tonight, on the 22nd, there's Teresa, you're on on the 22nd, as, but, and, we'll, and, uh, and we've got, um, and David's putting on four more, four more stories like we had today. Um, so, There'll be a program like today, but uh, Maria will turn in, will metamorphose into Teresa. Uh, so that's, uh, but fantastic. And uh, and of course, if any of you have got young storytellers anywhere that would like, you know, teenage storytellers, um, we're starting on what well, we started every Tuesday night. We've got a young tellers program and that's an open program and we have storytellers from across the world there so if anyone knows any any young tellers that would like to just come on for their own story round um that happens but that happens at, most of our programs are at six o'clock in the evening uk time uh but the uh the young one is at five o'clock because uh well partly because uh in Yulia's land romania there's a, it's two hours later, so they have to get the bed a bit, and also the same time frame in Gaza and other parts. So, uh, I'm going to shut up now. You can talk to each other, and Jackie, it was lovely. I, I'm, I, please get in touch because I'd love to put on a pro. Oh, have you as the second half of one of these programs for a full set? That'd be brilliant. As, uh, Thank you, John. And yeah, Jaina from Gaza is going to be telling a story among the young storytellers on Tuesday. I'm going to I'm going to hear her story tomorrow, and then she'll tell it here on Tuesday, and there'll be lots more. And uh, I just want to say a thank you again to the wonderful storytelling teachers who joined us today. For wonderful and Maria, wow, lovely, lovely set of stories at the end. Thank you so much. What a lovely. Oh, and Maria, we got I've got one more really important thing because there's loads of people listening to us on other devices. <laughs> um, come to, or uh, you know, Facebook, all sorts of things. Come to the site because Maria, as you see, is starving to death. Um, and would there's a little hat, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> so so she's got the hat tonight. Um, and uh, so um, so if anyone wants to put something, and you know, because you know the famine is back, and so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so yeah so so please feed maria by putting a bit in the hat tonight <laughs> oh, it's wonderful chat amongst yourselves for a while till Yulia kicks us out <laughs> i'm i'm just so interested in um, david's work um i i'm involved in some museum work here in ireland um in kerry writers museum we're doing, um, there was a, a thing that happened in Ireland at the start of the nation called Duchas, and all the children of the nation wrote their stories in copy books. And that's kind of inspired uh, Kerry Writers Museum to get a thumb print on history during COVID. So I'm interviewing war babies. Um, so people that were born during World War II for their resiliences. And then I'm interviewing uh, transition year students for their COVID coping mechanisms. And then we're going to have a chat between us and hopefully build a story. So that's where the story bit comes in, you know? Um, and wow. I'm just, I, I, I just think David that what you're doing is very similar. And um, 
there are some similarities yeah there's this this there's kind of two strands going on here there's the courses i run which are for anybody who wants to join them and really there are people joining from all over the world i've had teachers and storytellers from brazil as far as nepal and india and then my involvement as a as a volunteer with the hands up project where i'm working with um children and teachers in gaza as mm-hmm. i mentioned earlier and, and yes, if you, getting, if you want to know more heard. if i can cut in a second David, yes, yes. if you want to know more about the hands up project if you look at last monday's connecting the world by stories the mm-hmm. whole program is about the hands up project and it's nick nick bilbra who who david sort of introduced me to this world mm-hmm. um bless you david and uh, there's a uh, um, but Nick's got the whole program talking about the Hands Up Project, and there's some ch- teachers on there as well. So that's on the archive of the World Storytelling Cafe. So all programs can be viewed in retrospect, including this one. If you've got They're... friends, that, you know, if you've got friends, aunt, auntie in Australia, who you say you should have seen it, you know, <laughs> tell, her, tell her to go and catch this one. Yeah. There's, some, there's something we haven't mentioned tonight, John, but it's so important for all of us and particularly, like, well, for example, for the kids in Gaza, and that is the end of the Trump era. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, we are of one mind. But... Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, yeah. I, was at, <coughs> I was at Liz's session yesterday and I came in and I, I was number 46 and everybody was cheering and I was going what's going on and they were saying the number 46 because of the 46th uh, president and everybody was wearing blue everybody spontaneously who was dialing in was just wearing blue and we noticed that a lot of people sang songs instead of told stories because there was such an air of celebration so yeah you know Uh, the masked masked smile (laughs) <laughs> well thank you every thank you for being here michael thank you for coming you 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 are our most loyal supporter and uh, yeah and <laughs> you you for driving bus please join us for future programs those people haven't been here before um always welcome it is the door is always open in the cafe we never close